this episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Is that oil there? That's not supposed to be there. Buffalo races against the clock to turn two low-flying short-haul water bombers into transatlantic aircraft. A Buffalo mechanic guts it out on a remote airstrip in minus 40. And the C-46 crew faces the toughest landing of their lives. Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Midwinter freeze has set in. It's been teetering around minus 40 for days. So far, the weather hasn't stopped Buffalo Joe. He's still flying the daily passenger run from Hay River. But once the temperature slips below minus 40, even Joe stops flying. Uh, she's anywhere from 41 to uh, 44 below here right now. I don't anticipate anything moving more than uh, this airplane here. If any emergencies come up or anybody runs out of uh, heat or lights or groceries, we'll take another look at it. They have a threshold for flying in these frigid conditions. 40, 40, 40. That's about it. That's minus 40 degrees in the air, minus 40 on the ground, and minus 40 at the flight's destination. It's the trifecta of no-fly weather. There's that minus 40 threshold. It's a magical number. Once you get past minus 40, once you see a four in front of the zero on your thermometer, shit happens, man. At 40, 40, 40, the fleet is grounded by the cold. And that's a big problem for cargo manager Kelly Jurasevic. All of this stuff, most of it's food, and then I got bread and stuff in here. And then the freezers are full too. But we can only do what we can do. Buffalo Captain Devin Brooks is up early. But his girlfriend Janelle Glenn is still fast asleep. I seen her in the plane dressed in her camouflage snowsuit one day and then we just started hanging out. That was that was it. Hey. We just sort of met and kind of hung out and hit it off, I guess, and yeah. Good morning, son, Jenny. They're living together now. And they'll both be late for work if they don't hurry. See you at work. I drink lemon juice in the morning because it's supposed to wake you up. It doesn't really work. <laughs> Devin shows up where Joe's keeping a sharp eye on the temperature. It will go to the public forecast and get me, if you can, the forecast. I mean, that's, what, that's what's happening. I wonder what's going to happen. Once it hits minus 40, everything just freezes up quicker, and when you start a cold engine, more can go wrong. Devin's anxious to get flying. So is co-pilot Scott Blue. They get paid by their hours in the air. Checking the weather up the valley right now. Seeing the temperatures, and it's cold. So it's still cold, Joe? Get rested up, take it off today, and double up tomorrow. Sounds good to me. All right, thanks. It's still 40, 40, 40. Joe sends Devin home. But food shipments for the settlements up the Mackenzie Valley are backing up in the cargo terminal. So Joe's keeping one flight crew on standby and hoping it warms up just enough to fly. Nothing's moving in Yellowknife, but at the Buffalo Hangar in Red Deer, Alberta, 1,200 kilometers south, there's a lot going on. Buffalo Joe has just sold two CL-215 water bombers to the Turkish government. A $7 million deal that's crucial to Buffalo's bottom line during the recession.
Selling the planes was the easy part. The challenge will be getting these lumbering, short-range, low-flying prop planes across the North Atlantic. Right now, it all rests in the hands and tools of mechanic Corey Dodd. It is a very big deal. The economy is basically going for shit. You know, everybody's, you know, really scraping to get trips done and, you know, find work and stuff. We're still, we're giving her. This is the way we've got to make a living, so we've got to do what we got to do. Yeah, it's going to be good. Make some noise. Wake up the airport. As the chief mechanic for the 215s, Corey won't just be getting the planes ready to go. He'll be on board all the way to Turkey, too, in case something goes mechanical. Yeah, let's go give her a whirl. Start the engine. Get ready here. Come on, you old pig. Uh, we're going to ferry them across the ocean. And once we get over there, we're going to probably do a two to three year contract to maintain and crew them. It's a dangerous transatlantic flight that these planes were never designed to make. There is no alternate airport. There is no, hey, let's go land here or let's land in the bush or something. They're over the open water. And this isn't like your lake at your cottage water. This is rolling seas, high winds. The airplane behind me is not set up to be in a rock and roll and f wave fest. That's weighing on Corey's wife, Sonia. She's a pilot for one of Buffalo's main competitors, and she understands the risk her husband will be taking. A 215 is a smaller airplane. It's not pressurized. It's going to be down in the weather, and it is older. There's going to be less options when they are over the ocean uh, to even glide to safety wherever they may be. A lot of people joke that it's a boat and they can be in a better airplane, but uh, it's a big ocean and, and I don't think they would last very long. Corey said goodbye to Sonia a week ago before heading to Red Deer. If he can get the planes ready in the next few days, he'll go back to Yellowknife to see her one last time before departing for Turkey. And if he can get home, Sonia's got another mission waiting for him. Well, she kind of jokingly said that she would like to uh, conceive a child before we left. <laughs> Just so if something did happen, we could carry on my legacy. Well, Corey's is the man I plan to spend the rest of my life with. And, and if he doesn't come back, that's not going to work out very good. Um, it's made us think a, a little bit about stuff that's important, like uh, family. And maybe it's time to start that. But they can't start anything until Corey solves the major hurdle facing his dangerous flight the short range of the 215. The route that we're taking across the Atlantic, um, the airplane actually doesn't have enough fuel or oil to do that. In summer, the planes could cross the Atlantic via the northern route, making short hops from landmass to landmass to refuel. But that route is too stormy in winter. They'll have to fly southeast across 2,000 kilometers of ocean to the Azores Islands, a 10-hour flight. But the planes only carry enough fuel for about six hours. Corey has to find a way to get an extra 1,000 gallons of fuel on each plane. Well, it's all good. I hope. Back at Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife, things are heating up, sort of. Right now here is minus 38. Warm enough for Joe to give the one standby crew, Captain A.J. DeCoast, co-pilot Gord Cooling, and engineer Adam Smith, the go-ahead to fly. Oh, we're on the uh, Mackenzie Valley Food Mail run. We're taking groceries, private freight, all the stuff that uh, supplies the communities. They'll be delivering much-needed supplies up the Mackenzie Valley in one of Buffalo's vintage C-46 aircraft. Best to do the inspection before it gets covered in snow. Yeah, daily inspection. As the engineer on board the C-46, I have to be prepared to fix anything. Cylinders, tires, heaters. I've had to change many a thing up the valley. But with temperatures hovering around the 40-40-40 no-fly range, 
Adam, AJ, and Gord are hoping their 65-year-old piston pounder holds up on this 1,700-kilometer run. Coming up. Mikey loses radio contact with the C-46 and prepares for the worst. I got to go quarter date before I can initiate an emergency response plan. On a day so cold that no one is flying, a lone Buffalo Airways C-46 cargo plane has been cleared for takeoff. It's carrying essential supplies to settlements up the Mackenzie Valley. But the number two engine on this plane has been acting up lately. Engineer Adam Smith believes he's got it running smoothly now, but as he and Captain A.J. DeCoast and co-pilot Gord Cooling head to their first stop, things start to go wrong. We moved on the descent into Delany, and the engine started backfiring. Adam doesn't have much time. The engines can freeze solid within a half hour in these temperatures. He opens up the cowling and takes a look. Backfiring is not uncommon in these old 18-cylinder engines. Adam doesn't find anything wrong. The real test will come on takeoff. If you're going to have a big problem, you're going to notice it most on takeoff power, because that's the biggest strain on the engine. Right now, we're just running it out of refuse power setting, and it seems to be running pretty good. It's a daily challenge for Adam to keep Buffalo's 65-year-old C-46s flying. I don't know how to describe it. It's a love. I can't believe I get paid to do this. But these planes are in Adam's blood. His father, Jim, was a legend at Buffalo Airways. My dad was the chief pilot here for 15 years. I've been around here since I was nine. I started working here when I was 12. This is sort of a Jim Smith pictures. Jim Smith suffered a fatal heart attack at the age of 48 while driving a car on the tarmac at Buffalo. My dad died on December 15th, five years ago now. Uh, Adam looked up to Jim with great admiration as his dad, and Jimmy was very proud. He was hard on me. He actually uh, was probably a lot harder on me than he was anybody else. He wanted me to strive to succeed, and uh, so he kind of toughened me up. Since then, Adam's kept these old engines turning in the raw cold, and today, there's a new challenge. Heading towards the settlement of Norman Wells, the number two engine begins to lose power. Maybe it's a top cylinder or something if it's not leaking in oil, eh? Yeah, maybe. Could be a bag. Could be a high tension. Are you AJ's anxious to get the C-46 on the ground in Norman Wells, so Adam can get another look at the faltering number two engine. Things are quiet at Buffalo HQ. The C-46 is the only plane in action due to the near 40-40-40 conditions. It's pretty cold. Uh, you can get the bubbles to, to freeze, which is kind of neat. At these temperatures, uh, it just kind of turns into almost plastic. For Devin and Janelle, the cold presents a unique opportunity. We're going to ice fishing. Got the bait right here. <laughs> Since nothing's moving in the cargo terminal. Let me do it. Let me do it. I got the magic touch. Janelle has the day off, too. Ice fishing, man. Like, nobody goes ice fishing, I don't think, anymore. Let the games begin. Brains before beauty. 
<laughs> jig it, baby, jig it. I'm jigging it. Give me a fish, other than tuna. Like, I know the fish are around. We have to catch one. People deserve to catch yeah. fish when they go ice fishing, okay? Yeah, it's a lot of work. You know what? We need a freaking fish. We have a lot of fun together. Just give us, just give us a little tiny fish. Anything. It just works, I guess. Honor I just even want to bite. I just want to thrill, you know? I don't really care. Do you I get just off on something. the thrills, Miss Glenn? Yeah. <laughs> Janelle has lightened up this usually gruff captain, but the future for this couple is still up in the air. You know, I could get another job and go, and she could go someplace. I think he cares about what I want to do, you know, and he knows that I care about what he wants to do. That ah, was a good day. It was fun. We didn't catch any fish. We're going to head home, have a hot shower, go to the grocery store and buy some fish. <laughs> Twelve hundred kilometers south at Buffalo Airways hangar in Red Deer, Alberta, mechanic Corey Dodd is under the gun to figure out how to get two short-haul water bombers outfitted so they can make it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Hey, we're talking. Buffalo Joe is expected in a few days to check on Corey's work. Pressure? I don't know. You just got to deal with it. Yeah, I can't get too worked up. You just got to make things happen. Oh yeah, it's crunch time now. Now we got no more excuses. Corey's found a solution to increase the fuel capacity of the 215s. Uh, we're using these rubber bladder tanks. Uh, we're going to plumb them right into the actual airplane's tanks and then use auxiliary pumps to pump fuel from the cabin into the main tanks. That gives the plane an extra 1,400 kilometers of range. 529 U.S. gallons. So it'll be approximately 3,000 pounds. With two tanks per plane, Corey will be riding with 6,000 pounds of extra aviation fuel in his back seat. He has to make sure there are no leaks and no room for a potentially fatal error. Oh, yeah. It's the first time Buffalo has attempted a trip of this scale in a plane this small. Yeah. Might have a little more arrow. <laughs> this is the first time we put him in a, in a CL215. These tanks have been around the world several times. Probably been to Indonesia five times through Hawaii. They wouldn't have needed as much fuel as this requires to go through the Azores. It's a gamble, but there's just no other possibility for getting planes and crews safely to Turkey. If we can't make it to the Azores, uh, basically we're screwed. And if Corey's plan doesn't pass Joe's inspection, they're doubly screwed. Visibility to the west through to the northeast. The C-46 is on approach to Norman Wells, with the right engine continuing to act up. Captain A.J. DeCoast brings the plane down safely. The extreme cold has left Norman Wells Airport all but deserted. Buffalo mechanic Adam Smith is on his own to find the engine problem and fix it. It's the temperature out here, Gordon. Minus degrees. And getting colder. 40 below, you're looking at about half an hour before that engine's frozen. With an anxious pilot looking over his shoulder, Adam has to quickly zero in on a probable cause. I don't know what, what caused this one. It's amazing when you have a breakdown how like seamlessly things can, can be fixed or repaired, uh, depending on who you have together with you, or the same job can take a really long time. It just depends on who's leading it. Adam discovers the problem, a broken push rod. One of the push rods went through the push rod tube, so they got to replace it. Push rods control the valves in each engine cylinder. Spinning cams push the rods, opening and closing the valves in proper sequence. In these temperatures, it's not easy installing a push rod to micromillimeter specifications. It's a race against time. Your hands freeze up pretty much right away. They stop working. Uh, you freeze the backs of your ears if they're not protected. Your nose, my glasses freeze to my cheeks. Everybody's cold. You gotta be really quick because the engine will get cold and could freeze solid in minutes. It's all in Adam's hands. And his hands are freezing. 
still to come. Oh, yeah. Beat the shit. Devin and co-pilot Scott Blue try to land in deadly wind shear. Oh, Call the f***ing speed. On the deserted Norman Wells airstrip in 40 below, mechanic Adam Smith is replacing a push rod in the C-46's right engine as fast as his frozen hands can manage. And he has his late father, Buffalo's former chief pilot, to thank. My dad is the reason that Joe has C-46. My dad hadn't come to work for him. He wouldn't have gotten the C-46s. Jim Smith inspired Buffalo Joe to expand the fleet and he inspired his son to do his best. My dad basically took me under his wing. I worked till the job's done and that was all because of him. While Adam tries to fix the broken push rod with numb fingers, a bit of luck. A large portable heater is found at the deserted terminal. In the north, you grab what you need, no questions asked. This is a Herman Nelson. It's basically a portable heater. And it will loosen everything up because the oil's freezing right now and you can stick things together. It'll, uh, all the oil's sticking together so it makes it a little bit more of a challenge to uh, fix things. Things don't just fall apart like they should. This diesel heater could be a lifesaver. Well, if we're here for too long, it's gonna be very cru crucial because the engine will freeze and then it, it won't be, we won't be able to turn it over to get it to run. It'll be too cold to start, you just break stuff. If the Herman Nelson can warm the engine and Adam's hands, he might be able to get the repair done by nightfall. Should be about an hour from now, I hope. I yeah, would not want to spend Friday night in house. Norman Wells has a population of about 800, a small oil drilling town with little to do on a Friday night. On the frozen tarmac, the portable heater has done the trick. We had to change the tube, change the seals, put in, find the right length push rod because they're different lengths. You gotta sometimes put the push rod in four or five times till you get the right length. The repair is done. The crew hurries to get the C-46 ready for startup, hoping that the engines haven't been exposed to the brutal cold for too long. If you can't move the propeller, you won't be able to start it. Pressure's coming up, uh, fuel pressure's normal. Now we can get out of here. Carry on and go home. But the repair has put them over an hour behind schedule, and no one has phoned company about it. Up here, it's not uncommon for a plane to be out of radio range from HQ. I can't get a hold of uh, HW. Um, hopefully, everything's okay. In Red Deer, the boss has arrived. This is your 500 gallon job? Nope. Right there is 529. That's it. Brand new one. Mechanic Corey Dodd is ready for the inspection of the new fuel and oil systems he's just installed. What do you got, you got This is your 539? That's 529. The giant fuel bladders, accessory oil drums, and new fuel lines should extend the range of the water bombers for their trip overseas. But the final call belongs to Buffalo Joe. And we're, and it's vented? Nope, these tanks aren't vented. Joe has his company and the lives of his crew riding on the CL215s, and he won't take any chances. And the oil? <coughs> the oil? The oil's right here. Where, where, do, where do these go? Those go up through the back of the wing yeah. into the tank, oil tank. If there's anything that doesn't meet with Joe's approval, it'll be back to square one for Corey. Does he ever use this in real extreme cold weather, these tanks? I don't know. Extreme cold weather? No, I mean, if there's 30 below here, we're not going to go anyway. Like, what about these, uh, these lines breaking? If one of the crew steps on a cold fuel line during flight, it could rupture the plastic hose and cause a dangerous leak. Oh, no, it's just that, uh, you know, 
you got to be very careful of plastic clothes in the extreme cold weather. They, they're, they do breakable. But no, it's not a lot of high traffic air. Nobody going back here, that either Corey or Norm. No, he's just got his normal mumble, mumble jumble comments and, that no one can really understand. But we all know what he's getting at, so. It's very good, very well. I like the, I like the, uh, the setup there. Corey's system passes muster. I guess he's pretty happy with everything. He had one little concern about the uh, clear fuel hose, but that should be not a problem. Keep them safe. Sit in your seat. Now Corey can set up a test flight and just maybe get home to see his wife Sonia before he has to leave for Turkey. But Sonia fears they'll have to put their plans to start a family on hold. I just have to go with the worst case scenario that I'm not going to be able to see him before he leaves. Flying in the dark, an hour from Yellowknife, the C-46 crew, AJ, Gord, and Adam, are trying not to think about their own worst case scenario. Uh, we're running at minimum power setting right now, yeah. There could be another broken push rod too, or mid valve or something. And there's another problem. The cross streets the issue, eh? Yeah, this is the cross street valve right here. It's very, very hard to move. If AJ has to close down the number two engine, engine number one will have to work harder, burning more fuel. It won't have enough in its wing tank to get them back to Yellowknife. The usual solution? Open the crossfeed valve, allowing fuel to be drawn from engine number two's tank on the opposite wing. But the crossfeed valve is frozen. It's minus 40 up here where we're flying. Not an obvious tag. So we're doing our best to try to get it back to home base. It's been a hell of a day for Buffalo Airways C-46 crew on the Mackenzie Valley run. The only plane flying in freezing 40-40-40 conditions is having serious problems with its number two engine. Captain A.J. DeCoast and co-pilot Gord Cooling are trying to get home to Yellowknife with engineer Adam Smith, hoping his recent repair work holds out a little longer. If we were forced to shut it down, then we'd be landing at the nearest airport, so. Back at Buffalo, Mikey tries again to reach the mysteriously delayed flight on the radio. The C-46 is still out of radio range 50 kilometers from Yellowknife. I got until about quarter to eight before I can initiate an emergency response by Mikey gives it one more try. TX7 is going to be the uh, Is Mikey trying to get hold of this? Uh, we're, uh, we'll be landing in about 20 minutes. OK, copy that 20 minutes. And the flight's back in radio range, and everyone's OK. So we're going to be coming straight in on 09. Yeah, just in front of the hangar, and then we'll open up and throw it in. After traveling in darkness for hours, the lights of Yellowknife are a welcome sight to the C-46 crew. Finally, Texas, you got three green, curvous, cool tables, long to join pressures up, one flip to go. There, go there. On approach, AJ decides to keep the backfiring number two engine running. The landing is smooth but the number two engine will need a complete maintenance check before this plane will fly again. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> but Adam Smith has one more job to do before he can get out of the cold. Tent it all up, you're frozen again by the time the airplane's put to bed, and then you go home and jump in a hot shower. A new day in Red Deer, Alberta. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader has arrived to take the newly retrofitted water bombers on a test flight. He doesn't get too excited. He just does what has to be done, and usually everything works so good. Arnie will also be the lead pilot on the dangerous cross-Canada and transatlantic journey to deliver the planes to the buyer in Turkey. Well, I've never done a flight uh, that far with that type of an airplane. I've done it with Herx and, you know, DC-8s and things like that, but not with a summertime airplane is what we're okay. dealing with here. So weather is the biggest factor. We're flying a summertime airplane in winter conditions. 
The crew needs this test flight to put any fears to rest. I'll just taxi it back here and then if everything's good, we'll blast off. Okay. Sounds good. They haven't even left the ground and there's already a problem. See that oil there? That's not supposed to be there. We got a pretty good oil leak on the oil cooler. So we're gonna have to change that out before we go for test flight. We got another couple of little oil leaks on the engine. If they hadn't caught this leak, the results could have been disastrous. The, the cooler's f The cooler's f Yeah. He's pissing out the bottom of it pretty good. We'll go when he says we can go. It's worth the wait. Well, I'd rather fix this here than fix it in a life raft in the ocean, so. Corey needs to fix the leak and get the test flight done today, or else he won't make it home to see his wife. I do hope I get to see him one last time before he goes across the Atlantic. That would mean a lot, lot to us. Corey and his team work feverishly to repair the leak in the engine cooler. This won't take very long. Finally, this CL215 is ready for a test flight. I'm ready to go here anytime. Arnie flies the 215 full out. I think she's pretty good, Corey. What do you think? Oh, yeah, whatever. Go ahead, man. I'm happy. I don't see anything wrong with it. Eh? Yeah, we're good. We're good. That seemed to work pretty good, eh? I think so. Good. The water bomber passes the test flight with only a few minor adjustments to be done. Miller type. Those are little snags, yeah. Little snags that can be dealt with by the other mechanics. Corey's got a flight to catch. I'll go back to see the wife and maybe make a child, see what happens. <laughs> Next morning, the temperature in Yellowknife is minus 36, allowing Buffalo to resume regular service. Well, today's not as bad as it was yesterday. It's still cold, but it should warm up during the day, so uh, the food needs to go. After a couple of unscheduled days off, due to the 40-40-40 conditions, Captain Devin Brooks is glad to be flying the Valley Run today. <laughs> you better laugh. You push, buddy. I can't push either because it's Devin's co-pilot, Scott Blue, is also his roommate. How's the early morning wake-up call go? <laughs> and he's noticed some changes since Devin's girlfriend, Janelle Glenn, moved in. I think the place gets a little cleaner. <laughs> it's not quite so dirty. The decor of the apartment has certainly improved. Certain magazines aren't around as much as they used to be with <laughs> Janelle around. Don't think you're ever up or neutral? Scott is Devin's friend, but in the C-46 cockpit, Devin is the boss. I'm trying to teach him what my captain's taught me. And just because he's my roommate, I can probably say a little bit more to him. He's old enough, older than me. He can take it. He's a man. I'm only doing it to try to make him a better pilot. It's a very difficult plane to fly. Um, you know, and I'm still learning every day. And Scott has little choice. At six foot seven, he's too tall to fly any other plane in the Buffalo fleet. I would have been checked out sooner if I could have flown the DC-3. Uh, a fellow by the name of James ended up getting that check out because he fit, I did not. I had to wait a few more months to get on the C-46. Like Scott, Devin started out at Buffalo as a co-pilot on the C-46. I was put in from float planes to C-46 co-pilot. I had a tough time. I was in the same boat. I couldn't fly the damn thing for three or four months. It's a very, very difficult airplane to fly. Once again, Adam Smith is the onboard mechanic. He knows what Scott's up against. Well, Scott's a pretty green co-pilot. He's got maybe 600 hours in the airplane, and that's not a lot of time for that airplane. Go selectors. Front's here, quantity's fine. Boost pumps, go on hold. Carburetor, cold, ignition. It's clicking for Scott now. He's getting 
better and better and better. Send free takeoff, sir, complete. You on that power, Buffalo 508, turn off complete, ready for takeoff. Buffalo 508, rig turn off, clear takeoff, runway 15. 508. They're on their way. Today's Valley Run will not only test Devin and Scott's medal as flyers, it will test their friendship as well. With clear, calm skies over the Mackenzie Valley, C-46 Captain Devin Brooks makes the most of this flight, taking the vintage warplane down to a low altitude. Look at that. Up here, you got the freedom to fly around, see different things. It gives you the perspective on how fast you're actually flying. Probably makes you a better pilot, too, because you're paying attention more. Sure, you're on a flight plan, but it's uncontrolled airspace, and that to me is, is fun right now. It's fun now, but there's trouble up ahead over Toledo. Located at the junction of the Mackenzie and Great Bear Rivers, Toledo means where the rivers meet in Dene. You got the two rivers coming together. You got the big rock for turbulence coming out of a valley and into another valley. So you get some pretty interesting winds and can be pretty rough in there. We got a warning that there was wind shear in Toledo, but up to that point, everything was fine. Converging bodies of water and land formations like Bear Rock, right beside Toledo's airstrip, can whip up volatile flight conditions on final approach. Coming over the trees, the airplane drops out of the sky. We can't do that. Because of its shape, the C-46 is extremely vulnerable in wind shear. Big, fat body, not very long, so it can get twisted and tossed. And when your crosswinds are changing all the time, it just isn't a good scenario whatsoever. Wind shear is a very hard thing because everything looks normal. I fly along and bang. It's like a thief in the night takes away your ability to fly. So it's scary. Back in Yellowknife, the Buffalo staff have heard the weather warning for Toledo. And that has Devin's girlfriend, Janelle, worried about his safety. There's only a certain amount of wind that the 46 can handle, like in a crosswind. So across like the, the runway, whatever they're landing on. And uh, you know, if it's if it's bad, then they can they can really crash. Yeah. Flying is just one huge calculated risk, right? Hopefully the pilots are uh, trained enough to deal with it. As the C-46 approaches Toledo, the threatening thousand-foot-high bear rock looms large. From past experiences, you know that bear rock is always turbulent. From our perspective, it's just stay away from it. It's bad. I've seen lots of wind shear in there, and lots of rough turbulence. As the wind buffets the plane, Devin gets set for a wild ride. Watch that speed every couple knots, call it out. Pilot flying is dealing with flying the aircraft, looking outside of the cockpit, you know, with quick glances. I was watching Devin as he was making his approach. He put full left-hand aileron in, and the airplane stayed level. And when I saw that, I go, oh, this is going to be bumpy. Oh, we're going to get beat this shit. My job as a co-pilot is to assist the captain. You slip into train mode, everything becomes, you know, short, sweet, to the point. Say it quickly, say it loudly. Your reactions have to be like that. Any, any variation. Scott knows a co-pilot's responsibilities on approach. Their head does not go up. Their head stays in the cockpit, and they're just scanning, 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 scanning everything. Calling airspeeds. But knowing what to do and doing it under pressure are two different things. All the Call the speed. Roger that. He doesn't need to look outside. His job is just to take care of the stuff in the plane called speeds. Call the speeds. It's vital. Every five knots, if not two. I just told him call the speeds every five knots and any fluctuation. You got to call it, man. It's been 20 knots. I'm going to get pissed out up here. In a life and death situation, there's no mincing words. He just didn't have his head in the plane enough. Devin needed somebody to vent on, and Scott was right there, and that's kind of the co-pilot's job is to get vented on. A sudden gust hits the 46 like an oncoming train. The plane suddenly loses speed and altitude. 
when when I hit the wind shear, I seen it on my airspeed that it dropped 20, 25 knots. I've never seen a 25 knot loss in 200 foot loss like that. Wind shear blasts them head on. With the gear down, flaps down, you know, you drop too much more, you can stall. A sudden top wind could slam the plane to the ground. One ten. Devon descends lower, just feet from the runway. Not bad. Devon overshoots the runway, aborting the landing, but he's not giving up. I'm gonna come in from the other side. He's going to give it one more try. I was thinking we should have left after the first one. Final approach to the remote airstrip in Toledo. C-46 Captain Devin Brooks has already made one attempt to land in extreme wind shear. Orchard, orchard, orchard. In 10 years, flying in this airplane, that's the worst wind shear I've ever seen in Toledo. Despite the treacherous conditions, Devin wants to give it one more try. I just had to. Uh, I got one, take it up to 23. 23, I'm going to you. Up top. The wind shear is nasty, the airspeed is fluctuating, the plane is getting tossed around a little too much. It's not something to be toyed with in any way, shape, or form. Well, he doesn't really have something to prove, but he's got to at least try as hard as he can to get the airplane in. And Scott, his roommate and co-pilot, is focused and ready this time. Let's take a look outside, make sure everything's fine. Looks good, I'm all right. Yeah. The second shot, we came around in a different pattern. I tried to stay over the, the Mackenzie River a little bit, see if it was any common. 85. 95. 90. 45. Running. It was my decision, and... I didn't feel like wrecking the airplane. See, the youngest captain at Buffalo means don't be an idiot, don't let it go to your head. I guarantee you every one of us has a little cockiness streak in us, but you don't take that to the left seat of an airplane. The wind shear was so close to the ground, we could have landed and slid off the end of the runway or something else worse could happen. Wind shear, 100 feet off the ground. We're just going to leave Toledo's freight on board and go home. What do you think, Adam? Oh, it's way too rough, man. It's not worth it. I don't really care if they don't get their food. Let's get the out of They can have their groceries tomorrow. I'd rather be alive sitting here talking to you about it than make a stupid mistake. That's being the captain of an airplane, Ed. These guys are all my responsibility. They have input. But at the end of the day, it's my responsibility and them. OK, you ready? As soon as he's home, Corey and Sonya rev it up in the Great White North. A chance to forget about the dangerous trip he's about to embark on. You can't dwell on if you're going to crash or die or whatever. You just got to plug away. You just turn into a nervous wreck if you're constantly worried about all that stuff. But it's impossible for Sonia to dwell on anything else. No, I won't see him until he's, they delivered the planes and then they would come back to Canada whenever that is. As a pilot, uh, I can understand someone wanting to do a flight like this. I would love to do a flight like this. As the wife of someone who's going to be part of the ferry crew, it's worrisome. And then, and then the big trip will be from St. John's to the Azores. Wow. Yeah. Oh. It, they just got to get there. They, they will. They will. Yeah. Absolutely. They are risking their lives. And I don't want to, to lose my husband over something like this. Scary, Scary but exciting. Scary. Corey volunteered for this assignment, and there's no turning back now. Next time on Ice Pilots NWT. 
Buffalo Joe has a meltdown over an operational screw-up. Goddamn clean shirt I've covered before. C-46 Captain Devin Brooks faces a tough decision over a job offer in Africa. And a Brit and his dog struggle to make it to a remote outpost to start a new life. I feel like I'm in a Second World War movie. Just about to get on one of these bloody things. 